Welcome back, everyone, to this uh, third panel uh, of our timely and interesting and important uh, symposium, uh, panel three, the Baltic in the League of Nations. Uh, my name is Håkon Ekonomo. I'm a historian at the Saxo Institute, University of Copenhagen, have worked for some time in various projects on the League of Nations, among other things, together uh, with the Karngram Soldaga, who was my my boss. Um, so I'm very delighted to chair this uh, session um, where we have three uh, paper presentations uh, by Sp uh, Sia Spiliopoulou Okemak, Karn Gram and uh, Donatas uh, Kupchonas. Close enough. <laughs> I say preemptively. <laughs> um, and they have 15 minutes each, uh, after which we'll open the floor for, for questions. Um, and I'll try to keep uh, my comments uh, very brief, so as to leave uh, a room uh, for questions and conversation afterwards. Um, so I'll introduce you first, uh, Sia. I, I gather we take all the questions in the end. Yeah. Um, so Sia Spiliopoulou Okomark is director of the Åland Island Peace Institute and Associate Professor of International Law at Uppsala University. Her work focuses on matters of minorities and diversity in international law, as well as on legal efforts uh, for the limitation of armed violence and war. Her most recent book in English is Demilitarization and International Law in Context, The Åland Islands uh, with Routledge, co-authored with uh, Heine Koski and uh, Kremula Juntunen, and in Swedish, Styr Åleningarna sitt öde, Demokrati Perspektiv på Åland, with Kavanus 2021. Uh, today she will present uh, the paper, The Åland Islands Dispute at the Crossroads of Ideas and Interests. Please, Sia. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for this very well-conceived panel. I'm um, a bit frightened to stand here because I know that in the League of Nations rapporteurs report the second one that I will be speaking about, all three lawyers say we should scrap historians. They have nothing to say about this question. They, will take, they only take one or the other side. So we should forget all about them. So from my perspective, the relationship between historians and international lawyers has not been very smooth all along. But I will, uh, I will try to discuss the Olan Islands question because I'm, I'm really keen to have your views on what the essence of the question really is. It's very difficult to present a very particularist situation as that of the Olan Islands in a way which gives justice to the broader questions that were brought forward by the previous speakers. As was mentioned, for example, by our, our first uh, keynote speaker, we cannot think of the past without thinking of the present. And uh, as we have also uh, heard, um, uh, the, the last speaker emphasized the importance of the views on the ground, the people on the ground, and how they think about the questions that are happening around them and about them. So I will try to speak of the island um, dispute from a broader perspective. But this is a geopolitics uh, uh, conference, so I thought I will show you um, how it looks like to emphasize what Professor Lambert very accurately said. This is uh, territory which is very difficult to navigate in very shallow waters with about six and a half thousand islands. And as Professor Lambert says, trade has been at the core of the idea of life around the Baltic Sea and the Orlanders are in the middle of this interest in trade. And I will not have the time to go into this, but this is a point where the interests of a small part of the territories coincides with the interests of a great power such as Great Britain, maintaining peace in order to keep trade going on. 
So the population figures, as you see, are as they were at, at the time, around 20,000 people on the Orlan Islands, with languages looking at the language balance very much as it looks like today. About 90% of the population speaking uh, Swedish, more than 90, in fact, at that time, uh, and 5% uh, with Finnish as the first language. When we look at the way the Orland Islands dispute is described in general, there are two major trends across disciplines, I would say. One is the nationalist paradigm, which explains the Orland question primarily as an issue of identity, where the, the language and the Swedishness versus the Finnishness of the Orland Islands is the determinant factor, and both of them co contrast uh, post to what is the Russian and the Russian presence. And that nationalist paradigm is then juxtaposed to an internationalist paradigm in analysis of a case like this one, where what is at stake is the success or the failure of international law and international society, the League of Nations in particular, about the ideas of multilateralism and least, um, but last but not least, the, the idea of international mediation and whether it's possible, its origins and its formats. But there are lots of myths which are circulating on a case uh, like the Orlan Islands. And I would say that it's part of the problem. Success is the problem. Because if we just present an, an, a case as a success, we render it as the exception that confirms the rule. The rule being that international society does not, is not able, does not have the tools. Uh, by rendering also uh, that as an exception that confirms the rule, we lack in complexity and re which renders the real relevance of the issue even lesser. So it's no surprise that James Barros, who is really the only person who still has written a major explanation about the Orlan Islands, and his book came in 1968, concludes in his last chapter by saying that power and only power decides such cases. So a very realist, very geopolitical view. And then there is, it's no surprise that you get the Armenians and Azeris or the Sri Lankans and the Tamils that I meet sometimes, and they tell you, we would also be able to solve our own conflict if we were placed between Sweden and Finland. <laughs> and I tried to explain why this is the wrong way of thinking and that, uh, that there is much more complexity and also danger at any moment. And I completely agree with, with the conclusion of, of um, both Professors Lambert and Afflerbach that it is very much the contingencies of the moment and the ability to use the opportunities by different actors that decide how things turn out. So I will try to be as brief as possible. But, and I'm using then three lenses, the Finnish perspective, the Hollandic perspective, and a more internationalist perspective. Finland was a grand duchy within the Russian Empire and had considerable autonomy, as uh, Tuomas de Depora explained earlier. But Finland had also used the opportunity to establish its own army, a known, uh, a known um, contingent, at the time when, after the Crimean War, the, the empire is forced to renew itself. The Declaration of Independence comes and then starts the whole problem of the recognition of the Republic of Finland. And it may be interesting, uh, of course, most of you will know that, that the Bolshevik Kerensky is the first uh, government to recognize Finland, followed more or less on the same day by Sweden. Uh, countries like France and Greece followed shortly, 
while the US and Great Britain waited until uh, much later 1919 uh, for the recognition. The, law, the war of independence or civil war or um, internal war, depending on the, the uh, term you want to uh, say, is important. And I will return to it on the Orland ground. While the Finnish constitution comes in 1919 and recognizes the position of Swedish language, as well as retaining continuity uh, uh, at a large ex extent from the previous Swedish constitution, which had been used throughout the Russian Empire time until 1917. And the first autonomy law for Åland is passed in 1920 and is rejected on the Åland Islands. Let's turn to the Åland perspectives. The Ålanders were integrated in the eastern part and they were doing good business throughout the Middle Ages. The four estates in the Senate of the Empire allows Åland to be represented through priests, through um, uh, farmers, and that representation is also kept. So Åland had its position in the old system. The Crimean War ends with the demilitarization of the Treaty of 1856, and that starts the international position of the Olan Islands. One could say that this was the ground on which the League of Nations was able to argue around the international character of the, of the system. And that offers uh, the continuity that was uh, discussed earlier about um, the, the, the British interest being retained. I think now I want to uh, emphasize a little bit what is happening on Orland on February, March 1918 uh, to make uh, ground for my argument that fear is one of the main forces that drive the whole solution forward. Uh, the lower picture you see is a picture of the so-called last Swedish expedition in March 1918. And that is when Sweden decides to send uh, its naval forces to Åland because at that time the uh, civil, the internal war, the independence war seems to be spreading over to the Åland Islands. And Sweden decides to send its naval forces. At the same time, Finland calls on to Germany, who sends their forces. So we have on the Orland Islands at that moment, the Reds, the Whites, the Germans, and the Swedes, all in this small territory of 20,000 people. And um, there was a battle and there were executions, and there were internments, and still in the, mem in the collective memory, the executions of Reds, but also, as it seems, and there is so little uh, research being done, the execution of people who had nothing to do with one or the other side, but, but were simply taken by coincidence or ill will. And that, um, realization by the Orlanders that the civil war could spread and the forces could be made permanently was the reason for the whole traction towards an international solution of the question. Um, there are lots of uh, internal um, initiatives on the part of the Orlan Islands, and this is the other main argument that I would like to be making, that they were able to retain a very active profile visiting both at the peace conference uh, and also later on uh, towards the League of Nations Council. There was not a unified voice on the Orlan Islands, and I think this is important, but what was, though, was a perception on the Finnish side that this is a separatist movement, and the two leaders of the, the movement for the um, 
position of the Åland Islands that is called Björkman and Julio Sundblom are arrested and taken to prison. So the situation on the Orland Islands has not always been as peaceful as people assume. And the background to that solution was not a situation as peaceful in Finland or on the Swedish side as people assume. The international dimensions, as, as um, was said earlier, there are two commissions. First, a commission of jurists and secondly, a commission of rapporteurs. We will not have time, I think, now to go into the details of each of these commissions. What I wanted to say is that also the second commission of rapporteurs are all lawyers, even though they are called commission of rapporteurs. And it's very interesting, not only the people who are there, we have Abram Elkus, who is the American diplomat, uh, and we have Baron Beyans from, um, from uh, Belgium, uh, as well as the Swiss Felix Calendar. So all countries with no direct interest and uh, both the British and the French wanted to keep out uh, of that. But we have a very interesting um, British uh, secretary, Edgar Nielsen, who had just worked with the Schleswig question before dealing with the Orland question. What is important is that today it's very difficult. We, we see how Finland and, 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 no, and Sweden have been working together towards the European um, integration project and now towards NATO. It's very difficult to imagine that, that at that point there was a risk of war between Finland and Sweden. And that is, um, for instance, commented by, by the Japanese diplomat Inazo Nitobe. Another track which I think is important is that um, in geopolitics, I assume that uh, a great uh, attention is paid mainly to the high politics and military actions. But here it's a question whether key figures of academics didn't have a very high position. And here are two examples. Edward Westermark, who at that time was a professor at LSC. He was a professor of anthropology and perhaps the, the greatest um, internationally acclaimed academic at that time. And then Gustav Ramstedt, who was an anthropologist as well and, and working um, on Japanese and Chinese questions. And the formula that the Orland Islands were uh, solved by, we can discuss what all this means, is a formula of complexity. And I think that this is one of the, the great advantages. It's not about one element, it's about several elements and a lot of attention. Not many conflicts of today have been privileged by so much attention and deep thinking as the Orlanders were able to be given. Uh, so if you invest effort, you may get some good results. If you invest commitment, you may get some good results. So I think that this is very much a case where idealism and realism have been able to be combined and where the different ideas have found a compromise. Some of the, one of the previous uh, speakers used the term compromise, rather a lose-lose solution than a win-win solution. And perhaps it was a, a, a lucky strike that the Orlanders were unimportant, relatively unimportant, but also their interests coincided with many of the interests of the great powers at that time. And this is a quote by Madeleine Albright, which I like very, very much. One of the, the last speeches she gave at the CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, saying that it's like a hot air balloon international policy, foreign policy. You need to keep both the idealism and the realism with ballast and hot air. And for that reason, 
I think that it's really important to be countering such myths that survive around different questions. Um, uh, and, and the Orland is such an example, and to, to resituate them under different conditions, including possibly the, the Finnish membership in NATO today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sia. Uh, now let me briefly introduce Karn Gamskjöldager. She's an associate professor at Aarhus University. Mm -hmm. She has worked extensively on European and Scandinavian internationalism, war and conflict resolution, diplomacy and international organizations in the first half of the 20th century. She recently directed the research uh, project, The Invention of International Bureaucracy, uh, and uh, which de dealt with the League of Nations and, uh, and its uh, uh, lifespan and uh, international uh, secretariat. Uh, and she's currently uh, the director of the research project Denmark in Exile, Practices of Displaced Politics, 1940 to 1945. Today, uh, Karn will present the paper, We are plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Scandinavian visions of and, re and responses to the League of Nations, 1918 to 1921. Please, Karn. Thank you, Håkon. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, to the organizers and given that this is after lunch also thanks to the audience for staying on <laughs> not going elsewhere um, yes so I was invited to talk on this issue of the Scandinavian states and their perceptions of and responses to the League of Nations and immediately this quote sprang to mind um, and probably some of you recognize it as uh, Bilbo Baggins' response when Gandalf arrives um, and asks him to come on an, and go on an, on an adventure. Um, and Bilbo is anything but excited. Um, and I think that very much sort of catches the tenor of how the Scandinavian states reacted after having survived the First World War and then being invited to engage in international politics at one of the messiest and most complex, complex and conflict-ridden moments in European history. They were like hobbits. Um, they enjoyed their home comforts. Uh, they enjoyed the safety. They enjoyed the good way of life. Um, and they were not going anywhere and um, jeopardizing that. Um, so I'll start by talking about um, this from a standpoint of their role perception as neutral states that had managed to keep out of the war. But before I do that, I think I might need to clarify a few points. Um, when we talk about Scandinavian states here, we talk about Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. So not the Nordic states. We exclude Finland, which, as we've already learned, uh, has its very own and very complicated uh, history at this point in time. And we exclude Iceland, uh, which is still part of the Danish kingdom at this point. Um, and like the first speaker of the day, I would also like to say that this is a very broad brushed overview. I think it's not fair that I have to cover three states. The others only have to cover one little conflict. But given that I'm no longer Håkon's boss, I think I will have to, to settle uh, for that. But that means that I'll focus mainly on what the Scandinavian states had in common at this point in time. Uh, but please keep in mind that those were three very different states with different national histories, different political ideological um, balances and, and different geopolitical positions, uh, not least. So we have Norway, uh, a state that only gained independence, independence in 1905. We have Sweden, which had a much more prominent and, and prolonged conservative political tradition uh, than Denmark and Norway, which had more prominent liberal traditions at this point. And we have Denmark uh, having to deal with having the Danish Straits um, regulating access to the Baltic Sea and being placed almost on the edge of the European battlefield, which made for a very different uh, threat perception in Copenhagen than in the other Scandinavian capitals. So just to make that clear when we proceed now and talk about which uh, features they shared. So to mention one, um, since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, 
the Danish, uh, the Scandinavian states had lost more or less all appetite for war and stayed very consistently on a policy of neutrality. We here except Denmark with the two wars over Schleswig, but other than that, keeping out of other countries' conflicts was a recurrent pattern. Um, part of that development was also uh, integrating the idea of neutrality uh, with broader liberal and internationalist ideas some from, some from the 1880s onwards. Um, the Scandinavian peace movements and to a large extent also the Scandinavian governments um, worked within a foreign policy framework that argued that uh, the spread of neutrality, the spread of free trade, and the spread of international arbitration and peaceful settlement of international disputes um, was the way forward and was the way to create a more um, peaceful and stable international, at least European, system. Um, so when we get to the end of the First World War, neutrality has become also a moral concept that promotes peace. And at the end of the war, the Scandinavian states had also learned that neutrality was a successful foreign policy strategy that actually managed to keep out of the war, even Denmark, with the position that it held. Um, so, so that's sort of a success story to begin with, but the problem was that the international ideological landscape around international law and international politics was changing. Um, and a key point in that regard was the idea that for international law to be efficient, it had to be enforced. Um, so uh, the League of Nations for the first time introduces a system of international economic and military sanctions. Um, and neutrality had lost a lot of moral credibility during the First World War, where in particular the Western powers did not really um, <clears throat> buy the argument anymore that neutrality was better than fighting the continental monarchist empires. Um, so that meant that from the outset of the post-war years, the Scandinavian states were very much on the defensive, trying to safeguard their neutrality and um, cut back as many obligations as possible in relation to the new organization, um, and trying to promote their old ideas about international cooperation, focusing on arbitration, focusing um, on, they put a lot of effort into developing statutes for a new uh, international permanent court of justice that was being um, planned for in 1917, 1918, thinking that was, that was something they could contribute. So, so that was sort of not really buying into uh, the political realities, but trying to sort of um, re-promote the ideas that had been uh, key to their foreign policies before that. Um, so I said that, that I would mainly talk about um, what tied these uh, countries together, but when we then look at, at how um, the three states responded to the actual League covenant uh, that came out of the Paris peace um, deliberations, there are very clear um, differences among the three uh, states. Um, so, for instance, Norway had a much more revolutionary-oriented social democratic party than the two other Scandinavian states at this point, so there was quite a strong left-wing opposition to league membership in Norway. Sweden, on the other hand, as I mentioned, had a fairly strong conservative political tradition, which meant that there was quite a strong right-wing opposition to league membership tied to the cultural and political affinities, mainly of the uh, Swedish upper class uh, to Germany. These two types of opposition, even if they came from very different directions, were basically uh, organized this around the same line of argument, which was that the League of La Nations was basically a continuation of the wartime alliance. It wasn't treating German fairly, um, and uh, it was important to develop a different kind of system where um, Germany was integrated to a larger degree and, and treated um, more fairly. And then you have Denmark, where on the face of it, um, um, Danish uh, membership was accepted unanimously in Parliament, so there was no um, detectable um, opposition on the surface. Um, 
And that doesn't really mean that Denmark was more keen on the League of Nations than the two other uh, Scandinavian states, quite the opposite. It was due to two things. One was that uh, Denmark had received part of Schleswig as part of the Paris Peace Settlement, and they considered it comp very bad taste to not uh, join the international organization that was going to defend their new border with Germany. They could, they could see that that would really not be uh, the done thing. Um, and the other thing is that the analysis in Copenhagen was basically that uh, we're so close to continental Europe and continental um, European conflicts that if a war or conflict breaks out, we'll be involved in it anyway. Like, the League membership won't really uh, complicate matters a lot if we have a severe conflict around um, Germany and Germany trying to get back into the European power game, we will have a big problem, member of the League of Nations or not, so we might as well join and try to get um, the, the, the benefits that, that come with it. Um, but what maybe also merits mentioning here is that there was, <clears throat> all this happened in Copenhagen against the backdrop of a very strong anti-militaristic version of the Scandinavian liberal internationalism that I described before. So whereas in Oslo and Stockholm, the analysis was that we really need to be careful not to take on obligations that will um, make neutrality difficult at a later stage. In Denmark, there were, but, but basically in Oslo and, and Stockholm, uh, the, the analysis was that basically it was a good idea. Like it would improve the international order that there was this concept of enforcement. It's just not for us. Whereas in, in Denmark and in particularly in the Social Liberal Party that was uh, head of government, uh, uh, that was in government at, at this um, point in time, um, the analysis was that the use of force was always a bad thing, even if it was exerted by the international community. So there was also a strong ideological pushback um, from Copenhagen. And um, that in part explains the very um, legalistic and, and uh, defensive uh, standpoint that the Scandinavian states took in 1917 and, and 18 was because Copenhagen was uh, completely against trying to move more in the direction of the uh, deliberations that were actually going on in Geneva. So that was Denmark's fault. Um, <laughs> um, but then it couldn't go on like that. Like the, the Scandinavia had to engage with reality again at some point. Um, so, and, and you can maybe think of the, of the time from the 1918... Um, Armistice and end till 1921 um, as a learning process where, where these systems sort of reconnect again. Um, for the Danish government, who, who had the largest learning disability in this process, um, the wake up call was really the negotiations that. Uh, took place at the Hotel Crayon in the spring of 1919, where they were invited by the peacemakers to present their um, concerns and, and their wishes for the new international organization. And, and um, the Danish government went there with the aim of um, making it possible to be permanently neutral and a member of the League of Nations. And they were quite shocked by sort of the, the complete lack of understanding of that position, the sort of the almost being laughed at for thinking that you can be a member of a collective security organization and be permanently neutral at the same time. So they took, took that message home that that was not an option and also that it was not on the table to give concessions to individual states as part of these negotiations. So what happened then was that the three Scandinavian states at the first two league assemblies in 1920 and 1921 um, worked to uh, um, lessen the, the obligations um, for in joining in uh, sanctions, uh, but not formulated as a demand from the small neutral states, but as a general rule where uh, when sanctions were being applied, there should be consideration given to states who would be disproportionately affected by joining um, 
the sanctions. So it was formulated as a general rule in a set of directives that were passed in 1921. And from then on, the sort of the, the relationship between the League's new collective security system and the idea of neutrality had, had sort of reached a, a, a level of stability that lasted for most of the interwar uh, period. Um, the same with the... Um, with the work with promoting an international uh, legal order, um, it became clear very quickly that the rest of the um, states at the Paris Peace Conference were not going to buy into a rule of law that was based on um, the equality of states, and for instance, in the composition of the Permanent Court of International Justice. Um, here, there had to be concessions made to power balances and, and the power hierarchies that existed. So those parts of the statutes that the Scandinavian states had developed were basically kicked out, and what was kept were the more procedural uh, elements of, of what they'd been thinking about in terms of how such a court could work. Um, so that was also a bit of a shock. The third shock that the Scandinavians got in this uh, time period had to do with disarmament because they'd been promoting the issue of disarmament sort of every once in a while before the First World War where it hadn't really been uh, that much of a... Uh, a thing that was negotiated, but it was still sort of declared as a policy aim. And then what happened at the first League Assembly in 1920 was that the Secretariat con contacted the Scandinavian states and asked them if they were be would be willing to table a proposal on disarmament that could kick off that discussion in the League of Nations. And they were like, there was shock in the three Scandinavian capitals. We are actually supposed to do it? Like, we are not only talking the talk. You think we should be walking the walk? This is scary stuff, <laughs> um, and they tried to, to sort of work their way around not taking on that p position, but it was sort of a very clear learning moment in terms of understanding that now internationalist politics was actually a field of practice politics where you had to do things and, and sort of negotiate diplomatically uh, to push those agenda forward. And the last learning experience that might be mentioned here um, has to do with how Scandinavia was viewed. So the Scandinavian states had done a lot during the First World War to present themselves as a neutral bloc, to, to sort of promote their, their power position in, in the concrete war context. And at the end of the war, they had developed these shared proposals for a new legalistic, very narrow kind of international order. And all that had been read in the European uh, capitals and which meant that now they had to act the part also in the context of uh, the League of Nations, um, which was, um Maybe it shouldn't have come as a shock because that was sort of the way they had staged themselves towards the world. But the reality was that there were quite big conflicts and dividing lines internally between the Scandinavian states. I've already mentioned the different ideological and, and geopolitical um, differences. But, but at the basis of everything was the fact that Norwegian... Um, politicians still didn't trust the Swedes after the breakup of the Swedish-Norwegian state in 1905, so there was very little trust at this point uh, among the three governments. So there's also sort of a construct constructivist element uh, to this period in Scandinavian history where um, they presented themselves as Scandinavian, they were perceived as Scandinavian, and then they had to act as Scandinavians. Um, so, last slide, Håkon. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, to just draw out a few sort of main patterns that then emerged when uh, work really got going in the League of Nations. Um, so, so the shock with tabling disarmament proposal um, didn't leave any permanent harm, and actually uh, the Scandinavian states did take up quite a... Um, an active role as sort of being rhetorical leaders of internationalist issues, disarmament, arbitration, mediation, and things like that uh, throughout the existence uh, of uh, the League. Um, and the, in, in terms of Scandinavian presenting themselves as, as, as bloc in politics, uh, 
really the leak came to become a catalyst for developing that role and that kind of cooperation even more because as the Scandinavian states were consistently being pushed on position taking on various uh, issues uh, in the league, uh, it was clear that they had to coordinate and, and talk to each other. So what you see is sort of a kind of transnational diplomatic community developing across the Scandinavian states in the context of the league where information is being shared, um, positions are being tried out and pre-negotiated before going to Geneva, roles are being distributed in Geneva as to who should be presenting which parts of a policy proposal or act on which um, agenda. So it does actually produce an entirely new and very sort of transnational Scandinavian form of diplomacy. But then, this is the interwar period, so it never ends well. <laughs> um, and, and neutrality kicks back in. Um, and it does so in, in several different ways. So there's a thing that is a clear uh, line of continuity from um, 1917, 1918, which is that the Scandinavian states consistently fight uh, tightening the uh, rules of collective security every time France uh, uh, suggests new uh, guarantees or more collective security, um, the Scandinavian states uh, oppose it. Um, there's also a more uh, positive story of neutrality um, unfolding during the 1920s and 30s, which is that the League needed staff um, and uh, it needed staff to handle all the contentious political issues of disarmament and minorities and mandates and so on. Um, and in that context, being from a disinterested, distant state with that kind of national uh, background was actually a very positive kind of political and professional capital. So a comparatively large number of Scandinavians came to work for the League of Nations in quite prominent roles in these policy areas. But I really can't talk my way out of how it ends, which is then by the late 1930s, the Scandinavian states decide to um, unilaterally draw back from the League after the failed uh, sanctions against it Italy in the Abyssinian crisis. Um, here is a, a photo or a cartoon from um, 1938 where they make their last um, push to draw back from the sanction system together with other small neutral states, the seven little dwarfs. And then we know how it all goes. A year later, um, it turns out that uh, really neutrality wasn't a possibility anymore and Norway and Denmark is being invaded. Sweden is not. And by that, Scandinavian unity has also collapsed. So there's that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Uh, we'll move on to the third uh, paper with uh, uh, Donatas uh, Kupchonas. Uh, he's a research associate at the Center for Geopolitics here at the University of Cambridge and a research fellow of Wolfson College, Cambridge. His research interests include uh, modern international history, relations between East, Central, and Western Europe in the interwar period, Cultural and Intellectual History of Diplomacy, Geopolitics of the Baltic Sea Region, International Law of Global Security, and Contemporary Russian Foreign Policy. Um, his monograph, The Vilnius Conflict in European Diplomacy, 1919 to 1923, is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. And today, Donatas will present the paper, The Vilnius Conflict in the League of Nations between Nationalisms and Internationalisms. Please. Thank you very much, Hakan. It's great to be part of this vibrant Baltic geopolitics community. Um, I don't have any pictures to show, but I hope I'll be able to keep your interest uh, nonetheless. Um, trigger warning, the stuff that I'll be talking about is quite a bit less, I shouldn't say civilized, perhaps a bit more hardcore, because Eastern Europe. Uh, but anyway. The League of Nations had been invented in many different places at about the same time, somewhere around the First World War. The person who gets credited most for its creation is American President Woodrow Wilson, but the League was really an international baby 
You can find liberal internationalist movements at that time pretty much, pretty much everywhere in Europe. In Britain, for instance, there was a League of Nations Society, which included figures such as Willoughby Dickinson or Charles Cripps. And among the architects of the League, there were also some Tory heavyweights, such as Arthur James Balfour or Robert Cecil. Cecil actually received the Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1937 for, uh, as a creator of the League of Nations, just as Wilson before him. To the dismay of many enthusiasts, however, the final version of the League's covenant watered down supranationalist or legalist maximalism in favor of classic intergovernmentalism, for reasons we will, know, we will not go into here. Suffice to say that this was a world of empires, their colonies, and a bunch of small and fierce newcomer states. And the idea that the so-called pygmies of international relations could bring Britain or France to court just seemed too abhorrent for the peacemakers, just as it probably is today. On top of that, the Americans bailed before the show even started in March 1920. Isolationists in the US Senate refused to ratify the, tre the Treaty of Versailles and to join the League. There was also no Russia of any kind in the League in the beginning and no Germany either. So that's already three of the most important powers that are not part of the project. And so when we come to the methods of dispute settlement uh, envisaged in the League Covenant, they were not too ambitious. There were essentially two of them, judicial and non-judicial. Uh, the judicial settlement was outlined in Article 13. It's basically a judicial settlement in the Permanent Court of International Justice or arbitration in any other tribunal of choice. There was, of course, no compulsory jurisdiction of the Permanent Court, meaning that both parties actually had to agree to submit the dispute to the court. And the second method, was a procedure which can be called mediation or good offices by the Council of the League of Nations outlined in Articles 11 and 15 of the Covenant, which say that if a threat of war should arise, any member state can request the Secretary General to summon a meeting of the Council, which would consider and investigate the dispute and then adopt its recommendations. But Council's recommendations were non-binding, unlike the UN Security Council resolutions today. And so the Vilnius conflict was the first major dispute where the young and very imperfect and still teething League of Nations had to face the villain called reality. And boy, the reality it was. I will not go into the merits of the Vilnius dispute here. Suffice to say that Lithuania and Poland quarreled over, over the city of Vilnius and its surroundings. Lithuanians wanted Vilnius as their historical capital. Well, the Poles said, yeah, but there, there were only 2% of Lithuanians in the city, and many more Poles, and that Vilnius was a jewel of Polish culture. Even without this dispute, both states equally hated each other. Lithuanians were trying to shake off any Polish cultural or linguistic or imperialistic influences which they thought were threatening the survival of their nation or language, while the Poles thought that Lithuanian nationalists were a bunch of rustic German agents and that real un uncorrupted Lithuanians could not but desire a union with Poland. In the six years after the beginning of the Great War, Vilnius changed hands six times. In September 1915, the Russians were pushed out from the city by the Germans, who occupied it until the final days of 1918. A few days after the German withdrawal, the city was overrun by the Bolsheviks, who made it the capital of the short-lived Lithuanian Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, also called Lidbel. In April 1919, Pilsudski's legions pushed the Bolsheviks out of the city. In mid-July 1920, the Bolsheviks retook the city again, and a Polish counteroffensive, however, forced them to withdraw by the end of August and leave the city to the Lithuanians. So our story starts here. In the summer and autumn of 1920, Lithuanians now are happy campers 
they're in the possession of Vilnius, and they have a peace treaty with the Soviets that they had managed to sign at the time of Polish misfortunes at the front, a treaty which gives Lithuania a very favorable border with Vilnius included. The only thing that they have to do now is to sit tight and keep Vilnius against the approaching Polish counteroffensive. The Poles, of course, were mad at Lithuanians because the Lithuanians were not really neutral in the Polish-Soviet war, and they let the Soviets use their territory in their offensive operations against Poland. It goes without saying that the Poles did not recognize Lithuanian-Soviet peace treaty, which dealt with territories claimed by Poland. It is at this point that the Poles bring the disputes to the League of Nations. But it was not about Vilnius yet. On 4th of September 1920, Polish Foreign Minister Sapiega asks the League to intervene and to stop Lithuanians from trying to capture the territories that the Soviets gave to them, or gave to them in the Soviet-Lithuanian peace treaty. This Polish address to the League, however, was made in bad faith. By the time they asked the League to intervene, Pilsudski was already plotting to push the Lithuanians out of Vilnius, and the Polish aim was just to buy time to regroup and to discredit Lithuanians internationally. The Polish side assumed that the League's involvement was not going to be extended to the Vilnius question at all. The League, on its part, saw this dispute as an opportunity to prove to the world that it was fit for purpose and that it did not exist for nothing. If the League couldn't solve the dispute between these two pygmies, then how on earth can it ensure peace globally? And when I say the League, at this point I mean the League's Intergovernmental Council with Britain, France, Italy, Japan sitting as its permanent members, but also its international, internationalist League Secretariat, and first and foremost its political section headed by Paul Montou, and his right hand, Pierre Denis, the son of the renowned historian Ernest Denis. And so the League is full of enthusiasm, and on 16th of September it invites Lithuanian Foreign Minister Voldemaras and his Polish counterpart Paderewski to a council session in Paris. And quite surprisingly, what was feared to become a nasty showdown, Eastern European showdown, turned out to be a spectacular performance where Paderewski and Voldemaras were embracing each other before other dignitaries in the sumptuous hall of Petit Luxembourg. This was all thanks to international pressure and thanks to the League people working both of them the night before. In the public session, Paderewski praised Voldemaras for displaying, quote, all the fine qualities of his Lithuanian race and concluded that there was no conflict between Poland and its younger sister, Lithuania, anymore. We may, therefore, Mr. Delegate, both congratulate ourselves on this happy solution, uttered Paderewski, advancing towards Valdemaras and extending his hand, and the two kept shaking hands amidst loud applause. There could have been hardly a better promotion for the nascent league. In closing the session, Leon Bourgeois, the French president of the council, stressed that what just happened will make clear to public opinion the nature of the growing moral authority of the League of Nations. The press internationally also joined the jubilation. polish lithuanian reconciliation read a headline in the Times. Based on the report of Paul Hemans, who was designated the official rapporteur of the lithuanian polish question, the Council called for the immediate cessation of hostilities and suggested the so-called Curzon line as the line of demarcation. It also established the League of Nations Military Control Commission, which was to go to the disputed territory and help broker and maintain a ceasefire. This commission was made out of five officers of the member states of the council, plus a secretary and a typist. Leading the mission was Pierre Chardigny, a French colonel, the others were his British-Scottish counterpart, Major Keenan, as well as an officer each from Italy, Japan, and Spain. And so in the end of September, this colorful League's control commission took a train from Paris to Warsaw and then to Suwalki, where Poles and Lithuanians were to start armistice negotiations. <laughs> 
What exactly are we going to do in Poland? asked the Spanish commissioner on the train. Of course, I have heard of a conflict between Poland and Li Li Lithuania, unless it's Latvia or Estonia. But to tell you the truth, until recently, I hardly knew the League of Nations existed, he said. Passing through Germany also revealed that League's authority was far from universal. After being told that he was dealing with the esteemed delegates of the League of Nations, a German train conductor replied that he did not really care about this, quote, idiotic institution. In Warsaw, the control commission was received by Pilsudski in the same special train where, after a couple of days, the Polish strongman would instruct General Zieligowski to carry out his attack on Vilnius. Pilsudski already tried to prepare the League for the eventual fait accompli. Will I be able to hold my troops back if they decided to march on Lithuania? Pilsudski asked rhetorically. The control commission, in turn, warned him of the fatal consequences that such an operation would have for the future Lithuanian-Polish relations. The League of Nations Commission arrived in Suwalki on 7th of October, 1920, uh, but the Polish negotiating delegation had been instructed by Polsudski to stall negotiations until the Poles finished clearing the Bolsheviks out of eastern Belarus, what would open the way to attack the Lithuanians in Vilnius. Under control commission supervision, the Poles and Lithuanians signed an agreement which established a ceasefire and drew a line of demarcation. Two days later, however, Zieligowski's troops, pretending to disobey Warsaw's authority, attacked the Lithuanians and captured Vilnius. Now, this was a supermassive international scandal. In London, in Paris, but also in the League. No one really bought the Zieligowski's mutiny thing. Both Paris and London considered Vilnius to be a question of Lithuania and Russia and not a Polish question at all. The British and the French feared that by overextending eastwards, the Poles would annoy the Russians and would be erased from the map of Europe again, just like in the end of the 18th century. The British suggested to the French to recall their diplomats from Warsaw as a way of pressing the Poles to give Vilnius back to the Lithuanians. But the French thought this to be too extreme, as they usually do, and uh, in the end, they settled on a joint protest note to, and, and live protest to Pilsudski. But there was, of course, not much that London and Paris could do against the blatant fait accompli, and Curzon admitted that most of the noise the Allies were making amounted to, quote, beating the air and attempting to hide our impotence. So what's the solution? Of course, dump the matter to the League of Nations. For the people of the League, the Polish fait accompli was particularly annoying, as everyone still remembered Paderewski shaking hands with Voldemaras just a few weeks ago. So what does the League do now? On 26th of October, the Poles and Lithuanians were summoned to sit at the council table in the majestic Palais des Académies in Brussels. And the atmosphere in the room, of course, was very different from that in Paris a month earlier. Since Paderewski's position was totally embarrassed, by Pilsudski's march on Vilnius. Now Poland was represented by much less emotional Jewish-Polish historian Shimon Ashkenazi. And the first thing that Ashkenazi tried to do was to discontinue the League's involvement. He said, thank you everyone for your work, but actually when we asked the League to intervene, it was not about Vilnius, so thank you, but we will deal with the Lithuanians alone. Such a position raised some eyebrows in the council, and it was clear that the council could not let Ashkenazi off the hook just like that. There was nothing in the covenant that would prevent a party from a unilateral discontinuation of the conciliation. Retaining the dispute in the league, this required either some sort of improvisation or some legal invention. And so the marathon of scolding Ashkenazi began with Balfour and Bourgeois taking their turns. And then Rapporteur Hemans stepped in and said, since both Poles and Lithuanians were bragging about self-determination, how about a plebiscite? And so another chapter of dispute settlement in the League began. Neither side could openly refuse self-determination, which had become somewhat of a buzzword by then. But at the same time, neither side could be sure of its victory in the region. <laughs> 
For the Lithuanians, it was clear that with 2% of them in the city itself, they would have to rely on Jewish and Belarusian votes. And the Vilnius region also was swarming with Polish underground paramilitary organizations. So it would be extremely hard, if not impossible, to pull this one off. The Poles could not be certain of their victory either. For the same reason, as results would depend largely on Jews and Belarusians, but also because the regular Zhilegovsky troops were of low morale and they were really unpopular in the region as they were antagonizing the local population with their behavior. But the league was already set in motion. And the result of its pressure was that both sides agreed in principle to the plebiscite. Of course, attaching all sorts of reservations, but the league already could start preparations. The key obstacle was, of course, Polish occupation of Vilnius, as it was clear to everybody that a plebiscite and a Polish occupation would be a farce. So the idea was to force Warsaw to evacuate Zeligowski's troops and to send to Vilnius an international force of about 1,500 men to oversee the plebiscite. Initial planning of this mission was a big success. Britain, France, Spain, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Greece all agreed to send their share of troops. Logistics, supply routes, and command structure had all been worked out. The rapidity with which the League was progressing with its international force really disquieted both sides of the dispute. And both Lithuanians and Poles actively worked to sabotage those international efforts. The Lithuanians turned to the Red Russians, as they usually do, for help and managed to extract a few menacing diplomatic notes from Soviet envoys in Lithuania and from the Narkom Chicherin himself. In those notes, the Soviets mocked the so-called League of Nations and threatened that the appearance of international troops could be treated by Soviet Russia as a hostile act. At the same time, the Lithuanians worked the Swiss and made sure that the Swiss would not allow the passage of parts of international force through their territory. The Poles, on their part, used their aristocratic connections to undermine the plebiscite. Prince Vladislav Lubomirsky asked his personal friend, the King of Spain, Alfonso XII, for a favor in the whole Lithuanian business. And as a result, Alfonso XII personally instructed Spanish representative in the League's Council to do everything that he can in order to help the claims of Poland. And surprisingly, suspicious behind the scenes activity of the Spanish member was the key factor that Mantu later quoted when blaming the council for the failure of the Vilnius plebiscite. And so we come to the last stage of the League's involvement, which is direct Lithuanian and Polish negotiations under League's mediation. For Britain, France, and for the League, it was clear that the Lithuanians had to concede something to Poland in order to get Vilnius back. This was just reality. No one was able to force the Poles out of Vilnius. The plebiscite failed. And in any case, total independent Lithuanian rump state looked like really an unworkable solution. And it was feared that it would fall under German or Bolshevik domination. And so Pulsudski's final attempt at federalism received careful allied endorsement. At the end of March 1921, Sapiega confidentially sounded out the British, French, and Italian ambassadors in Warsaw with his idea of solving the dispute by the means of a Lithuanian-Polish federation. Within such a federation, Lithuania would consist of two cantons, Konos and Vilnius, and each canton would have its own regional diet and its administrative organs with competences in education, finances, and cantonal defense. The two cantons would be united by a common legislative organ formed out of delegations from the two cantonal legislatures. The two states would share a common president, a, a common minister for foreign affairs and defense, and a common office for economic and communication affairs, while the Polish high command would lead the armies in case of war. The ambassadorial trio of William Max Muller, Hector André de Ponefieux, and Francesco Tomassini met at the Italian legation in Warsaw and we worked this plan a little bit to make it more palatable to the Lithuanians. The trio increased the weight of Lithuanians' votes in the election of the common president and made it pra practically equal to that of the 20 million Poland. 
The clause on the superiority of the Polish high command in wartime was removed in favor of a common chief of the army. Separate cantonal defense was scrapped in, scrapped in favor of a territorial militia, which meant that Poland would not be able to keep its regular army in Vilnius against Kaunas. Now, the gap between the positions of Lithuania and, and Poles was really comical and became apparent in the first rounds of negotiations. Lithuanians tried to weaken as much as possible all the federal links, and actually, League's rapporteur, Hemans, reworked the plan further to try to appease Lithuanian sensibilities. But what happened now was that neither the Poles nor the Lithuanians were happy with the project. But owing to the pressure of the League, the Poles accepted, in principle, the plan hoping that the Lithuanians would refuse it, which was what the Lithuanians did. They refused the federation in total. But the League was not giving up just yet, and Hemans presented another version of the project which tried to further appease the Lithuanians. And this new project dropped the idea of bicantonal federation in favor of a single Vilnius canton within the Lithuanian state. The Vilnius canton would enjoy some degree of autonomy as a Swiss canton, including its representation in the Central Diet of Lithuania. The Central Diet and the government sitting in Vilnius would then have the same powers over the Vilnius canton as the Swiss federal government uh, has vis-a-vis -vis the Swiss cantons. Um, the result of this all was that the Poles rejected this in toto, but even the Lithuanians were still obstinate, even though this was a pretty good deal. The British, who had been coaching the Lithuanians since the beginning of the dispute, told them, look, this is a perfect opportunity for you to embarrass the Poles and to appear as the good guys in front of the League, even though the Poles rejected it already. If you reject this one, this will be it. Us, the French, and the League will wash their hands and we will not want to hear about this dispute ever again. So the Lithuanians now found themselves between the hammer and the anvil. And speaking of the latter, Soviet typographic workers came to help and secretly printed and distributed leaflets and newspapers in Kaunas, calling those in favor of accepting the League's project traitors or hemansmen. There was also an assassination attempt on Lithuanian representative in the League of Nations, Ernestas Galvanauskas, so finally, in the last days of 1921, the Lithuanians have officially rejected the second human's plan. And so the active phase of the Vilnius conflict in the League ended here. The League was actually quite happy to cross out this permanent issue on the agenda. And so the Council resolution stated that we tried. Both parts, both, both parties rejected it. So whatever. To conclude, there was just no way for the the League of Nations to succeed against the sabotage of both of the parties and their international backers. What does the Vilnius case in the League of Nations tell us about the Lithuanians and Poles, other than that both of them were equally unbearable? Well, Pilsudski did not treat Lithuanian nationalists seriously, while Lithuanians would have rather became, become Bolshevik than allied with Poland. Now, what does this case tell us about the League itself? Yes, of course, it failed. But ultimately, I think we shouldn't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree here. The League was what it was intended to be in the Covenant, nothing less and actually a bit more. And what it did in the Vilnius case, it did reasonably well, considering its limited resources and considering the primacy of geopolitics. It stopped the hostilities, it named and shamed both of the disputants, it made them talk. Vilnius was a case in which the League displayed a bit of a personality of its own, which could not be subsumed by the national interest of Britain, France, or anyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you for three uh, lovely, uh, fascinating, thought-provoking uh, um, presentations, which I think sheds uh, three very different lights on, on, on the League of Nations, uh, as well as uh, the countries uh, in question. Um,
I'll open up the floor now. Uh, John will uh, provide you with a microphone if you have a question, please. Uh, questions, comments, we have about five, six, seven minutes. Yes? I wondered whether any of the panelists' very interesting contributions have any reflections uh, on the implications of the various presentations you made for the effective operation of the United Nations today in dealing with disputes and uh, issues that arise. Uh, I was clear when you were talking there were quite differences, significant differences, obviously, between the League of Nations and the UN. But nevertheless, the kind of capacity of international security institutions to assist in resolving issues was an, an, an issue which re was reflected through what everybody said. We well, we can, yeah, we can take a, a round. Uh, thank you. It's a very good question, of course, and it's a question that any international lawyer would almost immediately have in mind. Um, I think that there was, in fact, quite a lot of um, commonality or some common points which I find interesting, and, and they have been recurring. The first one is the principle of self-determination and how it is used. The principle itself appeared first in the UN Charter, did not exist in the League of Nations context. So I think the whole background of how it was discussed in the League of Nations remains as a, as a legacy for what we are doing today. And we can say that at least from, from the perspective of, of my work, um, the League of Nations work opened up for the possibility of uniting uh, national sovereignty with elements of self-determination because it was not only the Bolsheviks that had a problem with that principle, uh, nor was it only a slogan. It was uh, a push for uh, within the broader democratization movement. So uh, we didn't have much time to speak about that. So the democratization movements take place at the same time as, as the war. The, the other thing um, as a reflection is, of course, that the League of Nations opened up for the obligation of international society and the great powers to listen to the locals, if you so want. Of course, it was done in very different, even racist ways in the mandate systems, but still this was something that was not very clear or, or uh, constructively present always before. Um, and, and finally, um, in the Orland case, one of the great things that happens was that Ancelotti, the, the, the Italian, um, and, and Kekenbeck, uh, the secretary of the demilitarization uh, negotiations, made clear that the collective security system of the League of Nations and the specific security system in, in a treaty like, like the demilitarization treaty are complementary and that the collective um, security system does not uh, um, make um, irrelevant or unnecessary the adaptation in specific cases. So they managed to find a balance between the universalistic ambition and uh, the approach to specific cases. So there is a lot to learn from, from what they did. Yeah, I guess my answer would be rather banal. If you look at the League of Nations, the times when, when the League has a successful hand at international conflicts is usually smaller conflicts, marginal conflicts, where there are no major powers among the contesting parties and where there's already a potential for finding shared ground. Um, so that's p perhaps also what you, what you point to, to notice. Or where there is a benevolent hegemon that wants to put the muscle behind the organization. I guess to some extent that's the case with the Orland Island that Britain is actually very invested in boosting the capacity of the League to, to act in, in that regard. Um, but, but I guess then the question is when there's potential for finding shared ground, and that is maybe where there's also an element of norm building around the organization. And I didn't really talk about that at all, but the Denmark-Norway dispute over East Greenland in 1933 was a matter of two states wanting to build norms by solving a problem of quite a big scale in the context of an international 
court, so, so there's also that element of building norms, maybe. Yes, I agree. I mean, my short answer would be that the League was better than nothing, because before that there was really nothing uh, in terms of this sort of supra, an organization with a supra-nationalist uh, idea, especially when we compare the League to something like Vienna Congress a uh, hundred years before that. And, you know, with the League you have assembly, you have the International Secretariat, which was really, really internationally minded. Uh, they were pretty much like European commissioners today. They have to swear that they will not care about national interests. Of, and and they, they, they were like that, actually. You know, Mantou, Pierre Denis, these guys, they were well-educated and they really tried to make the best out of that situation in which the American withdrawal and, and the rest uh, uh, left them. And of course, just, you know, if you're someone like Lith a Lithuanian or a Pole, and if you, if you have to come to the League and lie in front of all these nice people, it's kind of hard to do. So, you know, it's, the League was always on the mind of, of, of the bad guys, uh, at, 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 uh, because, you know, it, it was everywhere. It was, it had a mission on the ground, for instance, as in the case of Lithuania. So it was a pretty significant force, even though it wasn't decisive in dispute settlement. Thank you. Yes, we'll have one more. Question for yes. Donatus. Um, Jusutki was trying effectively force Lithuania to the Federation from this perspective. Do you think he could have succeeded if, the, if, if he did not send the army in the first place, if he was turning the sequence of events? Yes, and the reason why he did not send the army was again the League of Nations, most of all. Also Soviet and German pressure, but the League was a very significant component in, in that decision, international or international pressure. Of course, when we say the League, we mean the British, but also actually the French. The, the French did not want the Poles there, really, especially until, until about 1921, when they signed this uh, alliance with, with Poland, then you know, they, they became more pro-Polish. But until then, the French still had this idea of a united and reconstituted Russia from which they could get back their money, which they invested before the war. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I answer your question. No, I was thinking more about Lithuanian attitudes, because if, yes. if, if Poles already took Vilnius from you and they are forcing yes. you to federation as a way to, for you to get it back, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be better if they never take this from you and ask you to you know, consider federation? The Lithuanians would have never agreed to that. That's the point. Pilsudski tried in the beginning. They had talks and talks and talks all the time. Polsudski's idea in the beginning was that, okay, we get rid of those Lithuanian odd bunch of nationalists and the rest of the population will come to us. So they tried a few coups in Kaunas, which failed uh, because they were all, Lithuanians were not alone actually, there were Soviets and Germans and you know, the, the rest, the British, uh, sometimes behind them. Um, and so, I think Pilsudski really cooled to this idea of federation by about 1921. And he said, whatever, we'll just keep Vilnius until Lithuanians get into a better state of mind and reconsider this. All right, uh, we've reached, uh, well, time is up. And uh, thank you very much to the three panelists for excellent presentations. Thanks you.